Julie announced that Sanders won four seats. And Julie's on top of that. I'll take that. Okay. Um, no, no, I don't want to take a set. One, two, one, two. Good morning and welcome. This is day two of Theorising the Web. My name is Marcus Breen. I'm the moderator for this panel. Uh, I drive down from Boston this morning, so that's why I'm still wearing a cap. And uh, we have four panellists, Brooke, Niels, Lucas and Emily. They'll introduce themselves with more detail if they need to. They each have 12 minutes and I'll be given a, a wind up at the 10 minute mark. And I don't think there's anything else I need to add. So without further ado, my pleasure to, to welcome Brooke to the stage. All set. All right. Um, microphone good. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here. This is actually my third Theorizing the Web conference. And so I'm going to be talking about 1099 Problems, which is the panel title, at the intersection of gender, social media, and independent work. And indeed, in recent years, entrepreneurship has become this much lauded ideal for contemporary workers. Um, recent years, we've seen this really tremendous uptick in everything from how-to manuals to online tutorials, even college courses, which are hyping this spirit of self-starter careers. And so I pulled these up from Amazon. Um, these are just a few of the titles included under the business section of Amazon, including we have the Internet Entrepreneur, How to Transform Yourself from Employee to Online Entrepreneur, and finally, Click Millionaires, subtitled Work Less, Live More with an Internet Business You Love, which sounds fantastic. So each of these texts essentially offers these kind of tried and true steps for digitally networked individuals who are trying to find a way to blend their pleasures for profit. But the prototype of the entrepreneur is a rather limited one, particularly when it comes to the tech sector. In the worlds of Astra Taylor and Joanne McNeil, the tech sector is a place where corporate culture is barely distinguishable from a frat party. And so what I pasted up here is a Google search I did for internet entrepreneur. Um, yielded the following results, and as you can see, there is a real lack of gender and ethnic diversity, which I don't think is particularly surprising, but it's incredibly unfortunate. Despite this, girls and women are very vibrant contributors to online spaces, including, but certainly a lot limited to, um, the feminized sites of fashion blogging, beauty vlogging, mommy blogging, and increasingly this kind of nebulous category of Instagram influencers. And so I've spent the last two and a half years interviewing um, people in these spaces who are trying to make it online through their digital cultural producer productions. Most of the interviews focus on what I call the aspirational laborers. This is essentially a class of unpaid workers who are hoping to get discovered, despite the fact that this system is highly uneven. It's very much a winner-take-all system. But I've also conducted interviews with about a dozen um, women who have successfully translated their passion projects into full-time paid careers. And so that's what I really want to touch on today. And in my talk this afternoon, my rather short talk, um, I'm going to highlight some of the oft-concealed features of the professional lives using the framework of what one of my participants called an Instagram filter that makes everything look so glamorous. And I'm going to focus on three features of their careers. Um, Multi-skilling as essentially a team of one, being flexible around the clock, and what I'm calling compulsory visibility. And I'm going to argue that these features get refracted through emergent social media norms, many of which we're quite familiar with, um, in very patently gendered ways. So we'll start off with independence. Independence is, of course, this venerated ideal for creative producers, and it often connotes a sense of artistic license, which is somehow outside or unencumbered by commercial constraints. Yet for full-time bloggers and other social media creators, being, quote, independent meant sort of um, adapting this kind of protean work style with the deafness to manage multiple roles simultaneously. So Amber, for instance, um, explained how exacting it is to manage this frenetic schedule when you are essentially a team of one. This imperative to juggle various priorities was not dissimilar to what Alyssa experienced, and I have her quote up here. 
Um, Alyssa was a longtime hobby blogger, and she recently felt like she had enough of an income to make the transition to professional. And so I asked her to address how she thought having this professional blogging career compared with something in a more traditional industry. And she said, it's harder because everything falls on you. You're the person for everything. You have to generate the income. You have to decide what's worth writing about. You have to be no, you have to be in the know in the mix. She said, there's no company assisting you. It's literally all on you. And so Alyssa's exposition, particularly this notion of individual responsibilities falling all on the self, it's an apt characteristic of contemporary worker subjectivities um, against the backdrop of kind of these progressive shifts to neoliberal economies and politics. That is, individuals must increasingly shoulder the risks that were once borne by their employment structures. But her comment also indicates how this kind of day-to-day -day responsibilities are shifting to a level of multitasking. To this end, full-time bloggers noted how certain aspects of their career get concealed to the public distorted through these kind of depictions of making a living doing what one loves. So Christina was detailing the seemingly mundane aspects of her career. She said it's, you know, it's something that requires a lot more work than just posting images. And so she talked to me about things like, you know, scheduling photo shoots, um, devoting time talking to her accountant and so forth. And she said, like many other young women I spoke with, that these elements of the blogger profession are obscured in popular representations. She said, I think a lot of people, when they decide to work on their blog, they're just like, oh, I'm going to be taking pictures all day and sampling products and having lots of fun. She said, but, you know, it's probably 40% of that fun stuff and 60% of making phone calls and making sure that I'm getting paid the correct amount for the money I'm working on. And so a lot of other participants um, explained kind of the same sense of how their creative, expressive elements of their profession had been eclipsed by these instrumental business dealings. And so in some cases, people even kind of lost the exhilaration of their creative careers because it amounted to grunt work, making phone calls, responding to emails, and ma managing this frenetic schedule of meetings. And I don't think this can be out understood outside of a long history of women's work as invisible, both culturally and often economically. So the second feature I want to talk about, which is closely associated with individualism, it's this notion of flexibility. You know, we all have these flexible jobs where we can work wherever, whenever we want. So for female content creators, these discourses of flexibility tend to assume a, a political valence. And the assumption is by working from home, women can emancipate themselves from patriarchal work structures. Um, and, you know, to be sure, this is a very problematic narrative on a number of fronts. Um, not the least of which it just you know puts the onus on women to be the sole house sole caregivers and carers of the house. And now some of my participants did acknowledge the importance of having kind of this spatial flexibility, the ability to work from home. But Anna, meanwhile, helped to nuance this very pervasive ideal of flexibility. And so Anna boasted this storied career. Um, in the cosmetics world, and she ended up leaving it, she said, because, you know, I didn't have any processes to allow for flexibility. I had two young children. And so she had now started her own business, which was thriving. But when I talked to her, she said, um, she found it kind of ironic. She said, having the ability to set my own schedule means that I work around the clock. She said, you know, I find it harder to stop working because I work from home. It's harder to turn off my computer and say, it's done. She said, for me, that aspect has been really challenging, you know, because with technology, you're always on and you think you can be so much more productive and it takes away from being present. And I heard this notion of being always on quite a lot from my interviewees, um, especially with the performative aspects of social media. And so Heather was a former mommy blogger um, and she was talking to me about how exhausting it was to manage this career. Um, she said she spent a lot of time mining her life for content that she could post on social media. And she gave me this quote. She said, um, this career, she described it as, she said, it's like the fastest hamster wheel that is on. It's the fastest hamster wheel possible. You don't ever get off it. There is no rest. You don't, you're always on, always getting new content, always, always, always updating every social media platform. And I realized this is like the slowest hamster wheel ever, but I, I chose to go with the image of the cat rather than the, the fast hamster wheel because it's an internet conference. So that's basically the rationale for that. Um, so this ideal of being always on also came across when Heather was talking about basically her inability to have a moment off even when she was on vacation. 
Um, Heather said, you know, I didn't have a vacation, and if I did, I would have to do an incredible amount of pre-posting, essentially getting um, her content geared up so she could step away because there was this expectation her audiences would miss her. Um, and so she recalled this time where she's like, I was on vacation, my kids were in the pool, and I'm upstairs in the hotel room, you know, trying to get something published. And this idea of being always on leads to the last feature I want to talk about, um, compulsory visibility. And so this, uh, this idea was articulated through the display of these presumably private moments with one's followers and fans. Um, and it was markedly gendered. The ideal of mediated visibility called for this dissolved boundary between one's personal life um, and their professional life but in ways that assumed a traditionally feminine subjectivity. So displaying the body, displaying the domestic spaces, again, showing vacation with families and so forth. And so even those who had, did not have any kind of performative aspect of their actual career, so here I have a quote that's talking about um, Shaban, who was a designer and one of her designer friends. And so she was telling me this conversation that she recently had where this woman, um, her friend Deidrea, was a jewelry designer, and her advisors were saying, you need to do more lifestyle. They're pushing her. She said, even though she has a successful jewelry business, they're pushing her to make it bigger. She said, so, you know, you need to show how cute your daughter is. And she's like, you know, why do I, and show how dressed she is. She said, why can't I just have my business? Why can't that be enough? You know, why do I have to prove to everyone that I have this, perfect life just to sell my jewelry. You know, Siobhan concluded, which I think is very prescient, she said, you know, it has nothing to do with actually being a designer. Okay, thanks. Jen similarly transitioned from fashion blogging to design, and she said something with, which I think can resonate with many of us. She said, a lifestyle blog is supposed to convey, this is how I live my life, this is how I am. She said, and then she kind of signaled the performative elements steering the blog. She said, is that really how you live or is that how you want to portray your life? And there's all kinds of memes like, you know, breakfast on Instagram and breakfast in real life. And I love how all the bananas have these little sad faces. <laughs> So I'm going to wrap up here. Um, the characteristic features of independent work, creative freedom, flexibility, and self-directedness, these are repeatedly valorized in contemporary discourses of entrepreneurialism. But as the accounts have made clear, the attributes of these enterprising subjects are marred by work patterns that are quite less than idyllic. Um, and such labor often gets concealed behind kind of a kaleidoscope of images and textual reference that seem to attenuate the labor of making a living doing what one loves. And so I really liked my informant's mention of the Instagram filter because I think it's a testament to our culture of vigilant self-monitoring that steers our contemporary social media activities. You know, we brand ourselves with resolve. We untag our unflattering photos. We build our credibility through friend and follower counts. And we harness our online persona to these pithy self-descriptors that essentially function as kind of these digital sound bites. Yet for fashion bloggers, beauty vloggers, and other denizens of the feminized digital media economy, this Instagram filter worked in very purposeful ways to present a notion of internet entrepreneurialism that didn't necessarily resonate with their lived experiences. And so these images must be understood apart from traditional constructions of feminized work as a means to have it all or live the good life. But perhaps in closing, we need to rethink our idea of digital entrepreneurship to move away from discourses of masculine self-enterprise or work entrepreneur Barbie, who's ready to make a bold business move and strike out on her dreams. Good luck. Um, thank you, and I just a quick shout out. So yesterday I had one of my colleagues start a, a Twitter account because he was the only one in the conference not on Twitter. So, so please follow him. Thank you. <laughs> right, so while, while Niels is setting up, you ready? Uh, yeah, good to go. just okay. uh, up, get my presentation up. Thank you very much, and uh, keep your questions for the end of the panel when we will engage in some discourse. When you're ready, All right. I'll leave it to you. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm going to hold this because. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. I'm Niels. My name is Niels. I work at the University of Amsterdam, and uh, what I'm going to present is is, uh, is is a highly condensed version of a paper I'm now in the process of writing, uh, and I think uh, I'm going to read because it hopefully helps me to kind of stay within the time limits, and I think what I have to say uh, contrasts nicely with the compulsory visibility that you just uh, mentioned. Um, so. Uh, 
Standing unassumingly uh, near a plain white wall, as if left unattended by one of the museum's cleaners, Josh Klein's cost of living, Aleda, problematizes the status of the art object in the age of 3D printing. Yet it does a lot more than this. As Ben Lerner has commented recently in an insightful article for The New Yorker, and I quote here, to confront the severed head and fragmented body of a janitor in a museum space is, is a discomforting reminder of the undocumented undoc material labor from which such discourses can help distract us. And the discourses he's, he's referring to is like the value of uh, and the importance of, of creative and knowledge work um, in our current economy. And I'm still quoting, somebody's still making the hardware from which you upload the data to the cloud. Somebody's still scrubbing the toilets at the museum that hosts your symposium on internet art. And I think that point is well taken in this, in this context, right? End of quote. A large share of this low-wage workforce consists of people of color, many of them immigrant men and women like Aleda, whose body client has digitally reproduced, disassembled, and then recomposed in a way that highlights both its segmentation and its identification with the cleaning products she uses daily. Cleaners and uh, cleaning products have in fact merged and the resulting hybrid objects on the card form an understated testament to the commodification, fungibility and perceived disposability of the service worker's body. Like the 3D printed prototypes on the card, the service worker is subjected to the logic of plant obsolescence, redundant as soon as the next batch of better, in this case cheaper, younger, more docile units of labor become available. This it is this labor that is truly hard to see in America, which makes it in turn makes it difficult to really see America. So this is a reference to the, you know, America is hard to see where um, where you could see this, uh, the, the, the Whitney uh, exhibition. Um, so how does one value something one cannot and often does not want to see? How do contemporary digital platforms and their infrastructures of connectivity, evaluation, and surveillance affect this relationship between value and visibility when it is mediated through the problem of labor as at once a commodity and a lived experience? In this brief presentation, I'd like to address these questions by focusing on the gendered, racialized, and class distribution of opportunities and vulnerabilities associated with digitally mediated service work, or what I call platform labor. In other words, I want to talk to you about the ascendant on-demand or gig economy, which is shoring up a particular order of worth whose neoliberal reason leverages inequality and severs the link between labor and livelihood for those at the bottom of its entrepreneurial infrastructure. For these workers, the cost of living frequently exceeds the unstable earnings from what Susie Cagle has aptly called platform captured self-employment. So, while my, uh, many commentators have tended to focus on the novelty of the on-demand economy, I argue in my paper that the interconnected phenomena captured by this term form both a continuation and an intensification uh, of developments that have been taking shape over the past four decades particularly with respect to the fundamental restructuring of labor markets and the internet. And I don't have time to really go into this, but I just want to point you to one quote that I really find kind of that captures at least the part of the restructuring of the labor market. So I, I, I quote uh, um, Jamie Peck and Nick Theodore here, in restructuring workforce systems and rewriting the social contract governing employment, employers have sought to both download the risk inherent in a volatile economy and to offload the responsibilities that historically have been associated with the standard employment relationship. Many turning to various labor market intermediaries, as they call it, to assist them in mobilizing and managing flows of contingently employed workers for precarious jobs. So following Peck and Theodore, I conceive of platform, of, of, sorry, of, of con, uh, contemporary on-demand services as platform labor intermediaries that despite their self-presentation as tech companies, operate as new players in an expanding temporary staffing industry whose traditional business model is being disrupted by a more austere, zero liability workforce as a service model that leverages software to optimize labor's flexibility, its scalability, its tractability, and its fragmentation. This is accomplished through various techniques and strategies that I discuss in my paper, uh, and that can be grouped um, as follows under the categories of immunity, control, and uh, fungibility and superfluity, which I see as highly connected, so I group them together. Uh, again, I don't really have a lot of time to, uh, to go over all these, the, 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 the various strategies and techniques that can be categorized, but I'll just mention a couple very briefly before I continue with an example also. Um, uh, the most famous now is, is worker misclassification, right? So to shed uh, re legal responsibilities uh, relating to the employment relationship. Uh, that's one, I'm now talking about techniques relating to immunity. 
Uh, but also, there's all kinds of techniques and strategies that establish modes of discretion and information asymmetry that benefit customers and platform owners rather than workers. You know, to, to, you can, the platform owners can terminate an account, a worker's account, uh, when the worker has somehow breached the terms of service. But then again, the terms of service can always be changed. Uh, uh, they have the discretion to change it, which makes it a very, you know, very difficult and insecure situation. Um, Amazon Mechanical Turk uh, uh, customers can withhold payment if they if they are not happy with the worker's uh, uh, performance, um, which uh, effectively is, as, uh, constitutes a form of wage theft there. So th these are just a number, like a couple of uh, examples for, of the, the, uh, the unilateral discretion there. Um, another f form of, uh, relating to immunity is using outsourced customer service representatives and algorithmic management systems to form a buffer between workers and platform owners. So on to control, in relation to control, there's the, use of perf the extensive use of performance metrics and feedback notifications, uh, letting the workers know how they're performing, always in a competitive relationship to other workers. Uh, customer ratings are, of course, the most, uh, you know, one of the most important ones, which is basically uh, an outsourced form of worker management. Uh, then all, and there's also other types of strategic behavioral nudges and scheduling prompts, many of which have been pioneered by Uber, of course, as you know, but they're becoming more and more ubiquitous and important in an increasingly competitive market geared towards instant gratification. Lastly, in relation to fungibility and superfluity, I argue that the previously mentioned techniques of data-driven control turn living labor into a captive revenue stream that secures shareholder value while rendering these workers largely invisible to customers as well as to each other and even to themselves. This socio-technical obfuscation is in fact crucial to the orchestration of a fungible and superfluous workforce to the extent that it degrades service work as an abundant, calculable and easily substitutable commodity while simultaneously depreciating its value beyond the market sphere. I now turn to the gendered and racialized dimensions of, of such obfuscation with the example of Alfred. I don't know, some of you might know this service. So Alfred is an on-demand butler service that encourages prospective clients to, and I quote, experience life without chores, that's wonderful, and promises to alleviate their time pressures. In a way, it provides a meta service by sending an Alfred to a subscriber's home to manage not just all the chores that need to be taken care of, but also any other on-demand services that the subscriber may use, thereby positioning Alfred effectively as kind of the, the top layer of a household on-demand service stack. Uh, this consequently enables all these services to be performed in the background, as it were, during times when subscribers are at work or enjoying their newly procured time off outside of the home. As Nita Tanasowski and Kalindi Vora has, are, have argued, Alfred's real innovation may thus be its erasure of contact between subscribers and service workers who are made invisible and interchangeable through Alfred's platform infrastructure and mode of operation. So the kinds of degraded labor that Alfred conceals, and, and, and uh, Catherine Cross has, has uh, also talked about this yesterday during a keynote, it conceals a long, uh, that the, the kind of degraded labor that Alfred conceals has a long history that is distinctly gendered and racialized. Domestic service work has, in the United States, traditionally been performed by black, Latina, and Asian women in white homes. Notwithstanding Alfred's multicultural depiction of both its workforce and its subscribers on its website, and despite its best efforts to erase intimate service obligations from the home in a mode consistent with notions of racial and sexual progress, it cannot avoid inheriting, and I quote uh, Anatoly Soski and, and Vora here again, it cannot avoid inheriting the prior forms of racialized and feminized intimate labors supporting the nuclear, heteronormative, and white family form, end of quote. In other words, the post-domestic work fantasy sold by Alfred is implicitly yet inherently a post-racial and gender-neutral fantasy that effaces, I hope to pronounce that correctly, it's not my first language, uh, the history of how this type of work has been deprived of value while promoting the service and the on-demand economy in general as an inclusive and equal opportunity enterprise. Well, then you obviously, at one point, you always get to Donna Haraway, right? Uh, so, <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Um, so at a time when a growing share of formerly privileged white middle class men are experiencing what has been called the feminization of work, rendering their professional two minutes, all right, hopefully that works, uh, rendering their professional futures more insecure, it is just crucial to recognize that this has always been a nearly inescapable reality for those engaged in domestic and institutional service work, women, and increasingly also men of color. Uh, 
So in Donna Haraway's now famous words, and I quote here, to be feminized means to be made extremely vulnerable, to be uh, able to be disassembled, reassembled, think of Alida, uh, exploited as a reserve labor force, seen less as workers than as servers, subjected to time arrangements on and off the paid job that make a mockery of a limited workday, leading an existence that always borders on being obscene, out of place, reducible to sex. Yet as Haraway knows, such forms of structural violence that aim to devaluate, dehumanize, displace, and dominate the laboring body are not only gendered, but are also deeply racialized, emerging from a white supremacist tradition in which black labor and the black body in general is inherently degraded, unskilled, and superfluous. So disciplinary and biopolitical techniques that ensure immunity, control, fungibility, and superfluity are thus far from post-racial or gender neutral. They actively draw on earlier modes of controlling and exploiting racially feminized service work whose colorblind makeover as an investment in entrepreneurial futurity serves to hide the extent to which this labor is further subjected to algorithmic rationalization according to the just-in-time logic of on-demand market imperatives. So I, prob I probably need about a minute. I hope that's okay. Um, so finally, what, what I want to point out is that when thinking about the relationship between workforce as a service and racially feminized reproductive labor, we must look beyond the on-demand platforms that have thus far been mentioned and that are always mentioned. Next to services, just cleaning, home care, delivery, and other chore-oriented activities that unburden the 24-7 lifestyles of today's white-collar worker, adult webcam performances are another form of devalued, concealed, and ostensibly unskilled uh, on-demand labor that plays a vital for a role in social reproduction. This intimate, effective labor is reproductive insofar as it services these workers sexually and thereby relieves them of some of the stress that may otherwise accumulate and eventually impede on their work readiness. Yet this sexual maintenance work, which provides remote, interactive, just-in-time erotic entertainment, is organized through and held captive by a notoriously exploitative uh, industry whose performance-based and piece-rate payment systems make female bodies differentially available for consumption in, hierarchically, uh, in racially hierarchical visual orders of enticing thumbnails. So finally, and I'm coming to like 20 seconds, uh, rather than approaching uh, adult webcam performance as an exceptional type of service work, I propose that it presents an instructive example of the structural degradation of racially feminized reproductive labor. While webcam performers, like other sex workers, are certainly closest to being, and I quote Haraway again, obscene, out of place, and reducible to sex, they have more in common with other kinds of low-wage gig workers servicing households and businesses than may initially be apparent. Final sentence. Uh, crucially, what they share and this is the main point. Crucially, what they share is an investment in platform labor and its workforce as a service model, which ensures immunity for platform owners and customers, affords unremitting control over workers' activities and the data they generate, which is also very important, and positions these workers as fungible and superfluous commodities ready for on-demand consumption. Thank you. All right, thank you, Extra. Uh, 90, 90 seconds over, that's not too bad. <clears throat> All right, Lucas? So yeah, I'm going to do the you. same. I'm going to hold my computer. All right, you don't need this? No, I don't need this. That looks good. That's fine. It just sits here as the home page. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lucas, I'm a PhD student uh, in political theory at the University of Chicago and uh, I also uh, lecture at the New School in New Media. Um, so yeah, I, I, I chose, also this is, this is part of my, my research work and uh, I chose to kind of um, have some, uh, instead of having all of the academic apparatus and everything, to shorten it and not do justice to, to the nuance in the research and have some objects that are going to be more familiar in general to, uh, that have more cultural cachet rather than you know, scholarly ones. So I hope you uh, bear with me. Um, so yeah, so as many, as, as many of you know, over the last decade or so, the uh, issue of digital labor, broadly defined as any productive activity that generates value through digital technologies, 
from software development to sexting, has become an indispensable aspect of capitalism today. So much so, in fact, that any contemporary theory or critique of culture and society today must confront the problem of digital labor in one way or another. While the idea of digital labor has been put to various and different uses by, by critics of capitalism, at least one generalization concerning most of these critiques can be said with some certainty. Namely, that the, the, their indebtedness to a particular strain of Marxist thought associated with the post-war Italian Marxian schools known as autonomia and operaismo. As I will argue through the course of this presentation, what makes uh, many of these theories insufficiently critical, in my view, is their failure to account for the continuities between industrial manufacturing and digital informational production especially with regards to the furtive and pervasive ways in which capitalism continues to subsume its digital workforce through coercive, direct, and most importantly, racialized regimes of labor. So, uh, as many of you know and have read, uh, Adrian Chen's um, uh, great uh, expose in Wired in 2014, um, where uh, he uh, shows... Um, that certain American social media websites outsource the menial and unskilled labor of content moderation to the Philippines. In this article, Chen gives us an, eth an, an ethnographic vignette uh, of precarious digital labor through the stories of workers like uh, Ryan Cardeno and Michael Baibayan, whose work is informational, cognitive, linguistic, and technological, but at the same time, it's, you know, uh, censoring, you know, dick pics and uh, videos of beheadings and so on, right? Um, while these workers in the Philippines are, are employed by multi-billion dollar uh, internet companies, their work is very different from software developers in uh, Silicon Valley, as you can imagine, and so is their salary. Um, these workers are part of um, a, um, a workforce uh, that is over 100,000 uh, workers strong right now. Um, and their labor is to sanitize the mainstream web, to purge our Facebook feeds and Google search results from material deemed gruesome, violent, and explicit. So in a way, the labor that uh, genders provide in physical space, these workers are said to provide in digital culture, and that for that reason, they're called digital janitors, and we can problematize this term as we go along. Um, but what is um, important in, in this um, this line of work is that this growing workforce uh, here and abroad consists mostly of delocalized and subcontracted cultural workers who are also predominantly non-white, underpaid, and overworked. This recent emergence of uh, the uh, digital proletariat is an unde undeniable corollary of fundamental transformations in the capitalist mode of production since the end of World War II. Data generators are, are thus a result of late capital's pr productive rearrangements influenced as much by the advent of network technologies as by the post-war surge in finance capital. So throughout the 1960s and 70s, these scholars that I mentioned affiliated with um, the Italian uh, Marxist uh, schools known as Autonomia and Operaismo were among the first to theorize and critique capital's informational turn from a Marxist perspective. More recently, during the 1990s and 2000s, scholar, scholarly works by thinkers associated with the autonomous and workerist traditions made their way into the United States. Not incidentally, the widespread dissemination of this literature in the American Academy coincided with the acceleration of informational capitalism, the rise of finance capital, and the development of network technologies, including the World Wide Web in 1992 and Web 2.0 in the early 2000s. The reception of post-war Italian Marxism in the United States inspired a second post-autonomist wave of Marxist theories and critiques of contemporary capitalism. This post-autonomist turn, led in large part by the joint work of Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, proposed a politically optimistic view of informational capital, rooted in its salient and uncompromising departure from industrial manufacturing. According to these authors, the interplay between technological innovation developments in education and financial deregulation led to the following uh, economic transformations. The emergence of immaterial labor characterized by effective intellectual and creative activity, the movement in labor organization away from the capitalist sphere of production, the emergence of Marxist general intellect as an autonomous online site for immaterial activity, the return of indirect and formal subsumption of labor, and most importantly, the idea that the combination of all of these developments culminates in an anti-capitalist action as a harbinger of total revolution. It's very, very, very uh, optimistic, um, and they call it elementary communism. 
While post-autonomous theories accurately depict many, if not most, forms of skilled digital labor, their proponents can only conclude that informational capitalism affords workers the grounds and tools for revolutionary action by completely purging workers like Cardano and Biben from the material conditions of their work, the products of their activity, and their living labor from Marxist discourse. So I, I will just briefly outline um, three key problems with this theory and then move on to where um, these uh, problems are happening today in the world, mostly in Santa Clara Valley and some companies around there. Um, and then I will talk a little bit, give a, a historical narrative of um, the labor relations uh, in um, Santa Clara uh, from the 1930s to the 1960s. Just briefly mention um, how it went from uh, an, an agricultural industry, um, mainly um, uh, in, that employed a lot of uh, Mexican uh, immigrants, to what we see today in the Googleplex and, and other uh, firms, and what the relation is between those, right? Um, so briefly, um, the problem with these theories, not so much the problem as how these post-autonomous Marxists are characterizing um, informational capitalism. And to be very schematic, um, there are basically three ways in which they're doing this. Um, and they concern, it concerns the character of labor, which uh, they define as um, the, with the emergence, the emergence of immaterial labor, which is characterized by effective intellectual and creative activity. Um, maybe a difference from what maybe uh, Negri saw in the fiat factories. Um, um, the, uh, the capital labor relation um, that is mostly seen as, la labor is mostly seen as an autonomous phenomenon now, that it is not no longer um, organized uh, by capital and under uh, the, uh, the ages of, of capitalism, right? So then there's this idea that as freelancers, we gather around somewhere outside of the capitalist sphere, and then capital just uh, gives us a, uh, a certain a nominal fee for our work, but we own the, um, the fixed capital, we own uh, uh, everything necessary to produce this labor, and capital doesn't necessarily have to invest in that. Um, this has been um, said by Virtualoni who has a very sophisticated reading of, of, of Marx, in fact, and he compares it to, uh, to actually uh, feudalism, when uh, the, the feudal lords uh, never organized the peasants, they only paid them uh, for, uh, the, the, the peasants had to actually pay a rent uh, after they finished their work and so on, so that they were called the rentier class, and now these uh, capitalists today are, are again being called the, the rentier class as well. Mm. And this means that um, capital is subsuming, that is squeezing and oppressing um, labor in a different way. It's no longer a direct mode of subsumption, as Marx called it, as we saw in industrial capitalism. It's now a return to formal subsumption. Only indirectly does capitalism oppress its workers, right? And then the combination of these two um, factors leads to their... Um, quite optimistic uh, theory of, of post-industrial capitalism um, that immaterial labor produces social affects and autonomous subjectivities rather than mere economic value and is therefore seen as the pinnacle of laboring forms under the capitalist mode of production, right? A springboard for a uh, uh, revolution. Um, so here is why I think that this, these theories are misguided. And um, the divisions of labor and information cap informational capitalism are in fact more nuanced than traditional narratives of digital production. And one of the reasons is um, the return of uh, a labor that was originally um, taken away from the, the production cycle uh, during automation and now is called back into the computational fold. Um, and this, this, uh, this move is called heteromation. And so techniques and forms of heteromation um, have now substituted uh, automation in, in, in many ways, and I can't get into, I don't have time to get into all of the ways that, that this has happened, but um, the, 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 the reason behind this is that uh, 
the, the algorithms that we create uh, that we that we have today and the, and the technology that that we have today doesn't necessarily uh, wield the the um, cultural and aesthetic sensibilities um, to a certain degree of accuracy to do this sort of menial work, right? This menial work of transcribing and and so on, uh, and therefore there is this return of like very menial and and uh, um, industrial, I'd say, uh, uh, labor that returns to, to the informational fold. Um, I have uh, not done justice to, the, uh, to, to, to my presentation here because I spent too much time introducing it, but in, in one minute I'll basically say that uh, uh, Andrew Norman Wilson's work, uh, uh, video work, uh, Workers Leaving uh, the Googleplex, shows this in, in to, to a certain degree of, of uh, 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 Kind of accuracy and, and it's quite a forceful video and uh, it shows this hidden factory um, by the yellow badge workers at Google and basically what 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 how this works this work ties in to the history that I was trying to uh, gesture towards in the beginning of my presentation is that it's not incidental that uh, capital tries to hide uh, this factory which is completely hidden from uh, away from the the main kind of social and great infrastructure that the Googleplex provides um, because there is an entire history of uh, uh, labor relations that characterize this sort of work and I hope that you will ask me what these are in uh, the question period and I will uh, have more to say about it but um, I'll just leave it here thanks Okay, so Emily is our last speaker, and I'll let her do what she okay, needs to do. Okay, let's see. I'll fix it. Yes, okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am Emily Hund, and I'm a doctoral student at... Um, the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm going to present um, some research that I've been working on um, for a paper that I'm kind of have in progress. Um, so the most buzzed about figure in fashion today is the digital influencer, or the bloggers, Instagrammers, uh, pinners, and others who deliver curated content to audiences on social media and earn income by collaborating with major brands. Um, aiding their professional development over the last few years have been influence agencies who build metrics platforms, uh, negotiate deals between influencers and retail brands, and espouse the many benefits of expressing oneself online in tandem with corporate sponsors. Um, doesn't look so great, sorry. Um, central to the continuing evolution of the influencer ecosystem uh, is a variety of assumptions about and approaches to online audiences. On a practical level, influencers must successfully imagine, cultivate, and measure their audiences and deliver those metrics to advertisers in order to exist in their current monetized form. On a philosophical level, Audience metrics are hailed as a democratizing force in this notoriously closed off industry, and likes, followers, and other measures are equated with quality. Uh, despite this, how exactly influencers and marketers imagine and, and measure the social media audience is rarely interrogated, even though it has very real implications for the production of culture, from the way labor is performed to the way cultural products themselves, in this case clothing and fashion trends, are designed and distributed. So the findings I'm presenting today stem from a project I did that aimed to understand, um, as I mentioned, how influencers and agencies approach online audiences and begin to explore the consequences of their approaches. Um, so a wealth of research has, has explored the ways that people and organizations approach audiences um, and their potential social and cultural consequences um, over, their, over the years often focus on you know, traditional media industries like television and and things like that. Um, a, a common theme in this research is that audience measurement is guided by an institutional logic, 
um, which is a mindset that conceptualizes audiences as um, essentially faceless masses or economic assets. Uh, yet comparatively, comparatively little research has examined how these logics are being translated to social media. Um, so the, I argue this is necessary in the influencer context uh, wherein individual social media users have essentially turned themselves into uh, miniature media empires um, and an increasingly significant amount of user-generated content is advertiser-supported. Um, interviews with fashion influencers and agency executives, as well as a textual analysis of the agency websites, uh, revealed significant disparities between influencers and agencies' conceptions of uh, the social media audience, even though on, the surface, on their surface these groups seem to be in alignment. Um, so in unpacking three specific areas of, disparities, uh, of disparity, which I'll do here, I argue that their competing approaches uh, reveal a fundamental struggle at hand about the meanings of creativity and labor um, in the digital age. So the first disparity that I'll discuss uh, today is about the nature of a, of a creative worker. Um, in interviews, influencers made it clear that they view themselves as creative people who just happen to be able to make a living uh, from these impulses. As uh, my interviewee Jay said, I want to create all day long now. I just want to concentrate on making beautiful pictures and being creative. I have to stay true to myself. Uh, so comments such as these conjure up an image of the lone creative genius, uh, a well-wrought myth of creative production that implies that the work is a solo endeavor. Many artists and researchers of creativity, of course, have deconstructed this myth over the years, uh, yet it continues to persist, especially in uh, tech sectors. For example, uh, Alice Merwick in her book uh, pointed out how uh, the successful bootstrapped entrepreneur is sort of uh, lauded in, in a similar way. Um, other interviewees described more business-oriented approaches in the way they took their audiences into account uh, creatively. Kate recalled the adjustments she made with her blog a few years, uh, a year or two prior to um, our interview, um, as the influencer market became more saturated, saying, I think I just reacted to the fact that I wanted to keep my audience. In reflecting on their uh, creative processes and their audience's roles in them, then, influencers ultimately describe a situation of continual negotiation between affect and strategy. Um, they maintain that honoring their own creative satisfaction and impulses were the ultimate drivers of their decisions, yet they also acknowledge that they want and need their content to resonate with their audiences. Agencies, on the other hand, have clear messages about the nature of creative work uh, and the role of the audience in it. They tend to describe influencers in one of two ways. They might be publishers or content creators, invoking a streamlined corporate approach to creative processes or they might be channels who are activated in service of retail brands' needs, rationalizing away their personhood altogether. In agency rhetoric, the social media audience is conceptualized as a receptacle for branded deliverables, professional quality, platform-optimized content, as Hello Society, one of the agents, uh, agencies, described it. Um, so the second uh, disparity that I'm going to discuss is the role of metrics. In the influencer space, metrics are considered critical to understanding the audience. Uh, while each influencer in this study had her own strategy for utilizing metrics, common in, a common narrative arc existed among them in the way they characterized their relationship with them over time. At first, uh, obsessed, as Lindsay, one of my interviewees, put it, constantly wondering how their content was doing checking their analytics, typically via an iPhone app, um, and later an epiphany, realizing they should, reali they should recenter themselves around their creative voices in order to bring personal and professional success and fulfillment. And finally, uh, in control, deciding to have a less emotional attachment uh, to the numbers, checking them occasionally uh, to be aware of what's going on and to make well-informed, uh, rational, creative-driven de decisions from them. Lindsay was in the process of describing this here uh, when she said, I try to really let go of the numbers and love what I'm posting and do my job well and kind of let the chips fall where they may. But she continued, with that being said, like I'm going through this huge Pinterest overhaul right now. I definitely do give thought uh, to what performs well and what doesn't and why. 
agencies build the argument for the primacy of metrics and in turn the value of their very existence uh, by using the language of innovation. First, they tout their exclusive cutting edge uh, technology. Uh, Style Coalition offers a platform that they claim is an industry first, offering verified stats that measure influencers uh, reach and impact by viewing their fans and followers across blogs and social platforms. Uh, next, they hype its power. Um, the audience, um, another agency, says they offer a unique blend of creativity, proprietary technology, and influencer amplification that enables artists and brands to collaborate in popular culture and syndicate content to over one billion consumers. Um, they also boast that their uh, analytics platform manages every stage of the social publishing, publishing process at massive scale. The, interview, uh, or the influencers that I interviewed uh, who worked with an agency were generally not pleased with the relationship. Uh, one, uh, who I'll keep anonymous since we're live streaming, uh, to described it as uh, very tumultuous. Uh, it seems there is something of a power struggle uh, between the influencers who are interested in metrics but also wanting to pull away from them in favor of interacting with their audience and following uh, their own you know, creative decision making um, and the agencies who are encouraging influencers and brands to sign on for their services. Uh, and the third and final disparity that I'll uh, discuss today is uh, monetization. So professional influencers and influencer agencies share the goal of monetization um, and they both rely on a conception of authenticity to make it happen. Uh, but this means different things to uh, the two groups. Uh, for influencers, it all circles back to the primacy of uh, their creative processes. They want to make money, but they want to do it in a way that feels true to the creative drive that brought them to social media uh, in the first place. And they, they tend to adopt an attitude of, of do what works for you. Part of this may be because of the unexpected nature uh, of, of their success. While in the last few years, uh, the market has been flooded with countless aspiring uh, social media stars and influencers, um, many who are currently at the top of uh, the influencer game, especially in fashion, um, are there because they have been doing it almost since the beginning. Um, pretty much all of my interviewees started uh, creating social content not intending to make it a career, um, but as an attempt to regain control over other creative uh, careers they had, such as writing, uh, illustration, photography, design, that kind of thing. Um, these other careers, yes, yeah, <laughs> uh, that seem to be careening over a cliff in the wake of the reception. Um, then when advertisers noticed them, it became a career, as Kate uh, remembers here. Agencies are not as concerned about what goes on behind the scenes uh, with an influencer's process, uh, merely that whatever content she generates appears to be authentic uh, to her brand. The agencies also frame themselves as authentic um, or understanding of creative processes in the way they position themselves. Uh, the audience aims to distance itself from its industry, announcing we think like publishers, not like marketers. Uh, reward style frames their work as that of empowerment, saying they empower the world's uh, publishers and retailers to maximize market potential. Um, indeed, all of the agencies position themselves as helping, um, and helping generally means monetizing, um, but to the influencers, the view of how to do this is not always so palatable. So um, to conclude, the, the tremendous outward success of the influence economy has helped to cement its reputation as the most accessible uh, pathway for creative success in an age of otherwise decreased opportunities and precarious employment conditions. Yet by examining how influencers and the marketers who help fund them approach the social media audience, major disparities emerge, uh, including the three described here, ex exposing a fundamental misalignment uh, between the two groups driving uh, this growing space. Ultimately, the marketers in this space encourage a new way of imagining and using social platforms that feels frictionless and inevitable, where everything is measurable and everything is shoppable. Influencers can appreciate that, but they are in the end working to defend their creativity, autonomy, and instincts in the face of an increasingly rationalized and competitive environment. Um, as uh, Betsy Wissinger has argued, while metrics are attractive, the nature of the system in which they seem to be not a choice uh, but a necessity uh, needs examining in detail. 
And indeed, as I mentioned before, the history of uh, media measurement has been marked by um, bombastic rhetoric. Television ratings, for example, were celebrated as guardians of the public interest or an expression of democracy in action. Uh, yet findings such as those from a project uh, that Brooke and I actually did together uh, show that fashion's influencer economy is not really democratized. Uh, those at the top tend to conform to gender stereotypes, um, narrow expectations of beauty, and have pre-existing uh, cultural and economic capital. While the influencers uh, interviewed for this study uh, generally described themselves as uh, satisfied with their jobs, they acknowledged the limits. As Kate said, it's all about how marketers are best able to inspire or keep influencers moving on the track they wanted to go. The fact that the development of fashion's influence economy is held up as a model for other industries that have adopted it as a marketing scheme, which is to say most consumer industries at this point, um, underscores the point that creativity and labor remain broadly contested uh, concepts in the digital age. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have 20 minutes for some questions, so please uh, feel free to raise your hand or stand up or just speak as you feel led. We'll just check. going to go first because uh, that's a huge question right so um, there's no like you know, yeah, yeah. great no, answer um, what do you mean exactly just just to clarify uh, by you, we have to become part of the infrastructure uh, like you just if you want to sort of monetize yourself through YouTube you have to join YouTube if you want to you know get get brands through Instagram you have to be a part of Instagram and once Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think that's one of the the aspects of this whole digital economy that I find most problematic is despite these narratives that, you know, anyone can access this, um, it's radically empowering, it's challenging this whole top-down hierarchy. Um, for the most part, those who tend to rise to the top have, you know, already have some form of economic or social capital. They already have it into the industry. You know, they need the, the finances enabled to rise up to the top. Um, and when we hear a narrative of someone who maybe, you know, came from the outside and actually succeeded, I mean, the, the mainstream media really cling on to these narratives of, you know, holding this person up as the model of success. But, you know, that's that's the exception rather than the role. And so, you know, looking for places that seem to exist outside of this, you know, there, there's always spaces for creative activity online. But when you get to the case of monetization, these individual activities, what I found very much map onto, and I think, you know, what we've kind of found across the panel, map onto the existing logics of advertising generation and building audiences. And so in that case, in order for them to succeed in these traditional markets, which is, you know, valued by capital, we see it just confirming what we see traditionally. So there's, you know, spaces for the creative activity, but when you conflate the creative activity with profit making, that's when you see this kind of melding together of the, the top down and bottom up. Anybody else? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think that a part of the, the, the answer also as, as uh, we try to furnish uh, alternatives would be to think also about the other forms of labor, not just, you know, be beneath the screen level, you know. So, so my, what my presentation tried to touch on was what, what is the sort of labor, right? And, and that is part of the infrastructure in a radically different way to which you described, right? I mean, and, and it's not incidental that we don't know about that. And I think that in, we can't move forward in any critical way unless we uh, acknowledge and, and, and do something about that 
type of labor, that type of digital labor, right? I think that Trevor Schultz at the New School um, organized a, uh, uh, last year in 2015 uh, Platform Cooperativism, a conference where a lot of people who were trying to, to think about these issues such as Uber and other uh, uh, apps uh, in a kind of less capitalistic and uh, way that would uh, pay its employees a fair wage and so on. I think that for me part of the, 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 the answer is to uh, ownership of, of these means of production and uh, uh, sharing uh, in, a, in a meaningful way, in a way that is actually sharing with the workers, and uh, thinking of alternative modes to exist economically, not just uh, in, a, in, a, in a small social media way. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm trying to think. I mean, as Brooke mentioned, I mean, there are always other places you can go online if you want to. Um, just uh, engage in certain forms of creative production, but it seems like um, eventually, especially if you are in an area, these like feminized spaces that Brooke and I pay attention to that tend to um, have some relationship to products, whether it's you know be beauty products or fashion, even if you're not interested in, in working with advertisers, it seems that eventually advertisers find you. And, and because of um, broader structural structural problems um, it's like how do you turn down money when you know when, <laughs> um, when someone um, is offering to pay you um, to create content that you're already kind of interested in creating and um, there are bigger um, issues about um, being able to um, have a steady income and work in a way that is not um, you know, constantly under this cloud of precarity and things like that. Um, I think until that changes, I don't think I don't I don't know if there um, is an alternative necessarily. Um, I'm trying to think of when you mentioned um, things about like sites of resistance. I have heard I'm blanking on the name now, but I have heard of um, some a few um, like smaller like social movements, I guess, of um, young women. I know there's one in Canada now. I wish I could remember what it was called. Um, uh, of young women kind of banding together um, and saying, um, you know, to our, uh, fight against like the ash uh, the aspirational labor that uh, Brooke has talked about, um, and saying, you know, we deserve to be paid for all of our. Um, for all of all our labor and not work for exposure and that kind of thing. So that kind of thing is happening, but yeah. And like the larger thing that I was thinking also is that we sort of all work for Facebook. We all work for Twitter, mm -hmm. you know, every time we tweet something and we see it as a service, but really, you know, who isn't serving whom? And I just wonder like what we can sort of do to reimagine that as a society and to sort of to take back the power of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, do we have? Uh, it's a very long question. Yeah. Do we have a? Do we have another uh, person over the back? Sorry, just. Yep. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for. I'll, I'll just speak loudly. Um, a wonderful presentation. Really thought provoking. Really incisive. Really um, a lot of a lot of great stuff there. My, I, I'm new to this space. Um, I'm not sort of a, as immersed. So my first instinct is to to wonder kind of. Are these people, are, are the people that are participating in these economies and the Instagram and the, you know, it, 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 my first instinct is it's hard to feel bad for them or that maybe, you know, these people are not, you know, the people that are being exploited in these stru in, in, at the bottom of this sort of structure aren't necessarily the people who are struggling. Maybe they are, I don't know, but to feed their families or living under a bridge or something like that. There are people, you know, but then as I think about this, I wonder whether these kinds of economic systems, these kinds of technological hierarchies becoming more pervasive? Is this something that you see, you know, traditional industries, traditional opportunities for people to find employment or have autonomy? I mean, one thing Emily just said is, you know, how can you say no to that on one hand when they're offering you money, which, um, which kind of takes out the autonomy of it, and it, for me, it seems like a lot of these the people who are participating in these systems are some. It, it, it's somewhat voluntary still. Mm -hmm. But do you see this becoming more sort of totalizing, more of a 
inescapable part of mo the modern economy, you know, 20 years, 50 years down the road? Um, that's my question. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> um, I think we can, um, I, I guess I'll start by saying I first, my attention was first drawn to this before I ever came to graduate school um, when I was working, albeit this was in a creative industry, I was working in the magazine industry, but I started to notice how in order to get a job, you know, as an editor or as a photographer or, you know, people who are looking for traditional, you know, magazine jobs within an organization or at, a, or at a newspaper, or you know, things like that. Um, it got harder and harder to get a job if you didn't have um, this sort of um, presence online and sort of turn yourself into like a personality online and show that you have followers and that you have influence. Um, and that is like most definitely spreading um, beyond just um, those sorts of creative fields. Um, I mean... I don't, I don't know. I'm sure someone else well, can. Maybe Nils can, yeah, uh, can add something can about sex workers. Words, yeah. Everybody will be interested in sex work. Can, can we, can we, I, 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 I was, I just, I was just going to, to mention that the, the other side, right? Because that, that's w the, the, the one part of my presentation that I didn't get to was, in fact, what happened in, during the transformation of Santa Clara from the agricultural industry to the high tech with when Intel came in in the 60s, right? And so when you say it's very hard to feel sorry for these people and so on, that's, you know, one, one side. Of, of, of the digital producers who, who are being exploited by capital. But then beyond that, there, there are those workers who then were displaced by industrial capitalism and then are going into digital capitalism. And you, you, we, you know, it's very easy to feel sorry for them because they are you know, uh, uh, the proletariat. They are workers who were, uh, in fact, uh, displaced and, and, and were out of work for a long time. And then they're called back not to do interesting creative work on Instagram, but rather to uh, digitize things, to uh, scan books, to uh, moderate content and so on, right? So then like, I think that we, you know, in, in, in moving forward in this conversation, we really have to kind of negotiate both sides, right? On the screen level, and then the beyond data janitor level. So yeah. that's my. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I think some of this has already been mentioned. But um, what I just, I guess, want to emphasize is, is as the as work precarity is, is increasing and, and and it's becoming increasingly difficult to get a good job or <laughs> even a job, uh, and you have to kind of struggle. Um, one of the ways that we are trying to, uh, uh, what we need to do then in, in order to, to, in this hyper, hyper competitive uh, work environment or labor market environment is to self-appreciate. So we are always constantly looking for avenues to, uh, uh, to self-appreciate and to, to raise the stock value, one stock value, right? And, and, and I think the, the main infrastructure for us to do so is, 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 is the web and, and the, digi the digital economy. And I think, um, because the digital economy, or whatever that is, right, the, the, the realm of the digital, the, the, the internet, the web, uh, allows us to, has allowed to, for the uh, creation or the experimentation with different forms of value creation. Uh, not so much rooted in production, they say, right, uh, but ostensibly uh, more rooted in consumption and in, in circulation, modes of distribution, right? So uh, basically, it gives us a sense that that value is not created in labor anymore, but it's, it's created in, in all our, our everyday, uh, you know, lives and consumption, communication, like, huh, I mean, I just saw it, like Twitter blew up and, you know, all that stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's what we do is, is to put ourselves out there. And, and I think, so I guess what I'm trying to say in response directly to your question is the, the more precarious and uh, our, our, the labor market becomes and the more difficult it becomes for us to um, live the kind of lives our parents or our still hoping that we could live you know um, <laughs> it, it, it's um, um, you know what do you do um, and and this is very important like survival is this is a very important term here um, and there's different l levels of survival right like the kind of work the, the, the my presentation speaks to uh, a different you know <laughs> different different reality of what survival is but there that doesn't mean that you know white collar workers or well educated or uh, you know people uh, coming out of college and and thinking like yeah and then you know noticing that reality is just uh, not that great uh, at the moment um that that there's not a, a measure of having to survive unless your parents uh, keep giving you money but that's not a luxury a lot of people have <laughs> right 
Well, um, it would be I don't useful. Know if, that just, makes sense. if I can just add that, it would it might be useful to think about what what the data actually tells us about the level of of income that people are generating, uh, and many people are not generating very much at all. Um, no, YouTube has been, the, uh, the Google's been reasonably generous in what they what they will provide. But you know, if you look at the numbers from uh, downloading music, it's point zero 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 six or whatever it is of a penny per song. You can't make a living on it. Uh, you know, so the uh, while the people at the top of the pyramid are doing very well in continuing to join the one percent, uh, the entrepreneurial uh, folk, the, the those of us who are producing free content uh, on Facebook and so on, and making billionaires of the people who own it, uh, we need to be mindful of the fact that we're doing a lot of labour and seeing absolutely zero in return. Exactly. Oh, sorry, someone uh, down here. I oh, just want to just really briefly follow yeah. up, and the same goes for the on-demand or gig economy. You hear about these, you know, well-earning ta task rabbit or taskers, or you have, and you know, these are or the, the great uh, great pay Uber has, and for some people, yeah. but you know, there's a whole like this is a little tip of the iceberg, and the, the rest that you can't see that's under the the water is just people that are are actually struggling. Sure. Uh, to Quickly. Yeah. Uh, oh. well, is it relevant to apropos of this? No, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I guess I was. So uh, I'm really glad you brought up the Andrew Norman piece because I've actually like, watched his video on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that really interested him, and I came in like in the middle of your mm -hmm. talk, so I don't know if you touched on this, mm -hmm. was uh, the sort of racial divide that ends up happening in people's labor. And so like uh, the people that end up working in those yellow badges, as he calls it, tend to be uh, people who are foreigners or can't speak, you know, can't speak proper English, people of color. How do you see something like that intersecting with the, like, uh, the theories that you're presenting? Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, so I, I, I use Norm's work because it, it shows in kind of a, a, a direct way what uh, there has been, in fact, a lot of uh, uh, scholarship around this uh, ethnographic studies. And one of the more uh, forceful ones uh, actually um, analyzes this very movement in, in the, in the, in the uh, liberalized, in the uh, I guess flexibility of labor in Silicon Valley and how that affects uh, communities in San Jose and other poor uh, communities around there, right? And so it's very much about the intersection with labor, in, in, with race. And then you see that uh, these uh, these workers who are doing this type of work, and they, uh, in, as late as 2005, a lot of them didn't even have internet connection in their homes, right? So they are digital laborers that are completely excluded from this sort of digital economy or this very aestheticized social media realm, right? And uh, the labor that they are doing is in fact uh, cultural labor in many ways, and it allows uh, the, the, it's, it's essentially the platform and the means that we as cultural producers in this other way can then use these platforms and uh, kind of uh, interact with the content directly. So the way that this affects those theories of, of Marxism is that then you, we can't just speak of labor as immaterial, effective, and cognitive, and, and all of these great things. And we can't really have this incredibly optimistic view of informational capitalism until we address this part of labor, right, that uh, we won't see on Instagram. We won't see on Facebook, and, and we have to do ethnographic research to see this. We have to do like, like Chan did to go to the Philippines. We have to do like Norm did and, and see what's going on in uh, the, the, the outskirts of the Googleplex, right? So then at once we begin to account for that, then uh, we need to rethink these Marxist theories that have so much cultural cachet right now, and they're so trendy and so popular, right? So that was the point. Thank you. Okay, we have a... Comment here. Just a, a quick question. I think this is really key. I mean, this is mainly for Niels, and, I, and I'm going to respond to some stuff on Twitter, but, you know, this is relevant for all. So as a sociologist, right, like, I'm very comfortable, and I think it's important to make these great structural arguments about precarity, and I think that's really important. But as a member of the precariat, as a sex worker, I think that it's equally important, you know, or at least the question I have is that when we make uh, a structural argument and make very broad, generalized claims about the de degrading nature of precarious labor. And I think this could readily be uh, you know, expanded to all sorts of types of precarious and labor of digitally mediated service work that I presume that many people in this room uh, have been involved with in uh, various capacities. My question really for the panel is, what role then is left for the agency of, if, if you've already sort of a priori determined that this work is degrading, what, what sort of, 
level of agency have you then left open for uh, the workers in the room, who, by the way, you're expressing, uh, or you're, you're speaking to face-to-face -face right now, uh, you know, is there a degree to which, uh, you know, we have any, <laughs> you know, agency that doesn't simply reduce us to either totally complicit in, you know, this system or, uh, you know, just dupes being uh, exploited. And, you know, and I, and I think, yeah, that, you know, my go. concern is the totalizing nature of, of, of those arguments. Mm -hmm. Great. I think we really need. Before we run out of time, quick response. I, I just thought that, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Just to quote Marx, uh, the workers are the agents of history. I mean, I, I wasn't, um, I, I wasn't giving a, a, a totalizing. Uh, uh, I hope I, 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 I didn't, but uh, yeah, I agree. I agree with you in that. In in critiquing these structures, we have to think uh, ways in which the workers are are already exercising their agency and are already organizing in this way, such that our theories aren't just, uh, you know. The, theory, the totalizing theory of the bourgeois academic who is then talking about the workers in this way, right? So thanks. Thank you for your comment. I think it's really important that you said that. And, um, uh, you know, th I want to, I would argue that there's a, um, what I did here is a provocation, right? Um, I want, it's, I, I have 12 minutes and this was, uh, there's room for cultural critique and then there's room for, uh, for research. I'm myself an ethnographer, I do ethnographic work. So this is the first thing I wrote, uh, I've written uh, based on the new research project on on-demand economy that I'm going to do in the future, right? And I'm planning to do ethnographic and auto-ethnographic work in relation to this. But first, I want to, this was kind of a position paper, if you will. Uh, so this is kind of a provocative pr um, uh, position paper that then uh, will form a kind of a, a, a stepping stone, if you will, uh, to do uh, actual ethnographic or, or uh, social qu uh, qualitative research. Uh, having said that, um, of course there's <laughs> of course there's agency, and I think we s you see that in uh, things like um, in relation to uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. There's Dynamo, right, and and uh, Turk Opticon. Uh, there's Coworker, which I wanted to just give a quick shout out to as well. Uh, Michelle Miller's pl uh, pl uh, platform is really important. There's all kinds of alternative infrastructures and alternative initiatives that workers and uh, uh, relates to Uber's, uh, you know, the the whole uh, situation around Uber. Of course there is, right? So no, there there's a lot of agency and people are constantly resisting and one of the things I want to find out is how these resistances are working how they are subsumed but also how they're maybe tra transforming the particular things how these power relations play themselves out in concreto in, in actual uh, you know in, in everyday life so yeah sure um, but this was uh, this was one way of, of uh, you know of, of, of approaching this uh, so I, I mean I hope that that somehow um, and either and alleviates and your concerns or response but important it's not just about resistance, but it's that we have to feed our kids. Of and course, we're yeah. We're making choices to do jobs in a limited, you know, with a limited field of options, and many of us are choosing to do the best we can. Exactly, and that's why it's so important that there's uh, p proper infrastructures that allow that kind of work to thrive and to flourish, rather than also uh, uh, take place in, in, in uh, particular infrastructures that are not conducive for a, for a good, uh, uh, you know, for, for sex work, for instance, for, for webcam work. There are infrastructures, and they are already there, uh, that work a lot better for the worker. So we should need to think more about the worker and what workers want and need. And that's actually what I want to do, ask them. So what can we actually do to facilitate the work that is so important to social reproduction and important uh, in all kinds of other ways, but are currently not being f infrastructurally, technologically, or eco politically, economically facilitated and valued the way it should be valued. And that's my core al element. We need to rethink our orders of worth about what kind of work we value. And a lot of digital related labor is not, uh, and especially the service work related labor, reproductive work is not valued in a way we value a lot of tech or knowledge or creative work, okay. so-called creative. You can continue the conversation face to face after this. If you're looking for some good stuff on infrastructure or you're looking for some good discussion about uh, agency, then maybe you could uh, think about voting for Bernie on Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> and with that said, uh, thank you very much uh, for your participation and to the panel.